Hey everybody, happy Thursday. Very excited to um, be hosting this new class uh, for us this evening all about older wine regions and some older wine styles as well. It's kind of a combination of both styles and regions. Some of the older regions that we're featuring, the styles of which we're tasting those wines are a little bit more modern. And uh, then we've got a little bit more of a younger wine region, only, you know, 500 years old, um, uh, with a little bit more traditional styles uh, for two of the wines. So a little bit of a combination on both. But um, either way, we're finishing up May's theme of celebrating all things older. And this is the older regions class. Um, the first class we did was old vines, and we did um, very, very old vines uh, from all over the world, and, and we tasted four different wines from them. We did old favorites, so favorites of mine that I continuously go back to year after year. Um, then we did old wines, actually wines that were aged for, uh, like that were at least 10 years old, um, all the way back to a 26-year-old wine. And now finally, we're doing old regions. I am not announcing tonight uh, June's theme, but hopefully we'll be doing that tomorrow um, when, I, when I finalize all the details of the June themes of um, the virtual classes. So stay tuned for that, but we are going to keep them on Thursday nights, uh, 6.30 to 8 o'clock-ish. Um, and uh, as always, you can watch the recordings on your own time whenever you like. So by the way, if you're tuned in live, I'd love to hear who you are, where you're coming from. So pop in the chat box. If you're not tuning in live, I'd still love to know your thoughts on some of these wines. So you can either comment down below um, and I get notifications when people comment on those videos, or you can just send me an email or a text or a voicemail and tell me what you thought about the wines when you did eventually watch the video and taste these wines. So um, without Further ado, we're gonna taste some of these wines and uh, get to know some older wine regions tonight. Uh, I will probably be stuttering over my words tonight a little bit more because uh, it's my first day back from vacation. And I gotta say, my brain is still on the beach right now. Uh, it was uh, several days of really amazing beach weather and um, I took advantage of that. And so if I if I start um, just like, if I, if I stop talking for a little bit and just start like gazing into the camera, Someone just uh, text me or uh, or pop in the chat box to tell me to remember that I'm on live camera, not sitting on a beach drinking these wines. So, hey, Danielle and James, glad to have y'all here. Glad y'all got to tune in live. Um, I know sometimes uh, you're, you're not able to tune in live, so it's always great when that happens. So hopefully everyone got their wine in time with me getting back super late yesterday and um, and just getting the wines in today, it was a little bit of a hectic uh, race to get everyone their wines in time. So I apologize um, for the lateness of that. Uh, it won't be always like that, I promise. Normally I do the deliveries on Wednesdays. So, all right, um, we're gonna start off with the sparkling wine here. Um, so if you haven't already opened this up, you can go ahead and open this. I know if you're using the Coravin, it's really frustrating to have sparkling wine because you can't use, um, uh, the Coravin on sparkling wine. Um, so you're just going to have to commit yourself to uh, drinking this wine. Although, great news is I opened this one up when I first wanted to write a review on it. I even forgot to put one of those champagne stoppers on it and just put it back in the refrigerator where I have a lot of wine bottles and so it kind of just got lost in the fray. Well, a week later, without a top on it, a week later, I pulled it open. I thought, oh, well, it's probably not good anymore. So I go to start pouring out and it was fizzing up in the uh, sink. So I was like, well, let me just give this a, a taste and see. And I poured a glass of it and it was absolutely perfect. So don't think you have to drink it all tonight. Um, although you absolutely can if you want to. And I highly recommend that. So um, first wine we have got is Antec. Um, this is their Blanquette de Limo. Um, and it's from the Limo district, and Limo's in the southern southern part of France, right in the Languedoc region, um, right by Corbières. We've had some wines from Corbières before in these virtual classes and wines I featured. So if that name sounds familiar, it's just west of that. So on that Mediterranean coast. These are my new favorite glasses, by the way, for sparkling wines and rosés. Um, turn off my cell phone here, sorry. Um, they are the Riedel 
champagne and rosé glasses and I just love the shape of them. I think it's just, they're so beautiful. Um, so Crystal, like always, I always prefer a slightly thicker stem. This is not thick by any means, but some of them can be so incredibly thin, especially for champagne that I just always just end up like snapping them because I am a klutz. So um, I will be, if you ever see these, I'm always drinking these now with uh, my sparkling wines. I don't love the tulip glasses because they you just can't smell anything. So this has a bit of a wider mouth on it. So you can smell the wines, and that's, to me, um, most of the fun of, of wine. Certainly not all, but uh, when, when you get into analyzing wine, there's so much going on the nose on even sparkling wines that um, it gets lost if you serve it in a tulip glass. There's also the traditional, like, um, the Marie Antoinette coupe glasses that are, like, super art deco and are now a little bit more popular, especially, at, like, um, you know, these hip restaurants and stuff like that. To me, that's a little bit too much. Uh, champagnes have a delicate nose. So you, I want a smaller smaller opening, but you don't want it uh, so small um, that, that it, it loses that. So, But something too wide, you lose all your bubbles right away. That's the whole purpose of the flute. And the aromas escape too fast because of the wide opening. So all of them are fun, and I have all of the types of glasses, don't get me wrong, but when I really want to be tasting wine, then this is what um, this is what I like. So, little side note there. Um, so, Blanquette de Limon is the actual name of the AOC, or Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, um, uh, the French name for what we call AVA here in the States, American Viticultural Area. Um, it's just the controlled border of what is this region. Um, but here in the States, it's it's just a geographic boundary. In France, it's not just geography. It is also the style in which you make wine, how you make the wine, um, the yield that you have in terms of how many grapes you can pull from the vineyard and how many bottles you can produce, um, what grapes are allowed to be grown, what type of oak is able to be used, minimum alcohol content, um, all of these things go into the pretty tight restrictions for French wine laws to be able to put a certain region name on your wine bottle. So within, within this area of Limo, you have multiple different regions or classifications. Blanca de Limo is one of them. Cremant de Limo is another one. If you've ever had a Cremant de Limo, I mean Cremant de Limo, um, I have uh, featured those before, so I'm, 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 I'm quite sure you probably have either seen them or tried them. Um, and it's all in the same actual geographic boundary. The difference is the style and the rules in which they make them. So Blanquette translates to their local dialect for a little white one. Um, and so the grapes themselves are smaller berries. And so that's the, that's, the, that's the name of the local grape there, the very traditional grape there that is 90% of this blend, Malzac, M-A-U-Z-A-C, Malzac. So that's the name of the actual local grape there. It's been grown for centuries and centuries and centuries. And um, they made a, um, we'll get into this ancient, uh, the, the history of that in just a second. But so Blanca de Limo has to be 90% of this traditional grape Malzac. 10% of it, minimum, it can be 100%. Minimum has to be 90%. It can have some Chardonnay and some Chenin Blanc up there, but even the combination of the two cannot equal a, a, an amount greater than 10% of this wine. So that's what Blanquette de Limo is. It is made in the same style of Cremant de Limo, which is made in the same style of Champagne, and that is the traditional method um, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So made in the same way, same geographic region, a difference of the grape itself that is a la that is that is um, the predominant grape of this blend. Cremant de Limo is actually more Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc based. You can have some Malzac in there um, and you can have some Pinot Noir in there, but even combined those two can't equal more than 20% of the overall grape blend. The rest is uh, Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc. And mostly it's Chardonnay because the maximum you can have of even Chenin Blanc is 40%. So you don't need to know these numbers. Just know that Blanca de Limo is primarily Malzac, very traditional grape. Cremant de Limo is a little bit more of a modern take 
Um, and when I say more modern, I just mean um, in the last 100 years um, and especially in the last 50 years. Um, and thus, it is a more Chardonnay-focused blend. So Cremant de Limo, Blanquette de Limo, same style, same winemaking techniques, same even geographic boundaries. And this producer actually makes both of them, so the same producer can do both. Just one is Malzac focused, one is Chardonnay focused. There's another um, type of wine that comes from this area called Blanquette um, Method Ancestral. So it looks like ancestral method. Different than traditional method or method traditional. And that is because it is literally the method of the ancestors of this of this of this region and how they made their wine so that has to be actually 100 percent malzac the grape that's only 90 percent of this blend right here and they don't do what's called desgorgement um, in the wine so um, all of the yeast that's used in the secondary fermentation process of these wines that is normally expelled um, and we'll talk about that in a second and process called desgorgement that's kept in the bottle. And so you have a lot of these yeast particles. It's very cloudy. It's an unfiltered, uh, unfined, unexpelled, sparkling wine. So if you've ever tried a pet nut, kind of the same thing in terms of all of that yeast is still in the bottle. So you'll see that floating around. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the style that they <clears throat> made these wines in way back in the day. And so whenever wine's labeled as that, it has to be 100% the traditional grape made in that more traditional method. They're usually often sweeter, much softer bubbles too, very different style. Um, but you, the same producer in the same geographic region can make all of these styles. So there's also still white wines and still red wines from the Limo area. But what they're really known for is their sparkling wine. And in fact, um, got a piece of cork. Uh, in uh, my glass here. So sometimes that happens with sparkling wine. Um, even though you're not using a corkscrew on it, sometimes I get just a little bit of the cork on the bottom. Anyways, um, so so let's talk about sparkling wine. How is it made, first of all, and what is the history, and why is Blanquette de Limo so um, fabulously famous for being the ancestors of this? In the meantime, cheers, drink the wine, enjoy it. I'd love to hear your tasty notes um, so you can chat in the chat box or um, or just tell me if you're watching this video at a later time. So sparkling wine was kind of invented um, on accident. It was, it was discovered on accident and then it was it was it was cultivated purposefully years later but at first it was an accident and they tried to fix their mistake that became one of the best mistakes in the entire world so the mistake was they couldn't figure out why this wine had these bubbles in it why it was fizzy why it was spritzy they didn't want that to happen and they were trying to figure that out but this is before we understand the science of fermentation this is before we understand um, what is actually happening chemically to make bubbles happen during fermentation process so what's happening is they're picking these grapes they're picking them very late into the year. Um, so it's getting colder and colder and colder. And thus, when they're making the wine, it's pretty late into the year. So the areas of Limo, yes, it's right on the Mediterranean coast, but it's high up on this plateau and you have this strong winds that are coming down. Um, and this like mountain range kind of makes this whole area much colder than a little bit away um, and a little bit further south where it's lower elevation and we've got this like hot zone. So it's kind of this dramatically different microclimate um, here in the Limo district. And uh, it is it is just much, much colder. So they want these grapes to develop riper. And this is also, you know, hundreds of years ago when uh, when before the Industrial Revolution, before we had a uh, before we had the warmer temperatures that we see on a regular basis now. So they're waiting to harvest these grapes until it's much later. They finally harvest them, bring them down. But now their cellars and basements are very, very cold. This is before heaters or anything like that either. So. They start the fermentation process and that is just natural, right? They put the grapes in here, they're stirring them up, something's happening, they know that that makes wine, but we don't understand really the science behind it. Well, now we do, and the science is that yeast, and that's 
the yeast that's ambient and indigenous to the air um, starts to eat the sugars of the actual grape juice. That byproduct is alcohol, which everyone wants in their wine, and carbon dioxide, which normally, if you're doing it in big vat, the vats, barrels, or tanks, that carbon dioxide is just going to bubble up and evaporate into the air, no problem. In fact, when they're making it, they kind of know that when it stops bubbling, it's done. Um, or at least they thought it was in this area. They didn't know that yeast goes dormant or goes to sleep at about 43 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, they've waited very long into the year to start making these wines. Um, now the, the cellars are pretty cold, so it didn't take very long for the cellars to get below 43 degrees Fahrenheit and stay at that temperature or drop down even further. So these wines are being stalled in their fermentation process, but the winemakers don't know this, they think it's done. So they start putting the wine in barrels or bottles and put them in the cellar thinking it's done. Well, in the springtime, when the cellars start warming up because temperatures are rising, the yeast is not dead, it's just dormant or asleep. So it starts reactivating, comes alive, and starts feeding on the sugars because they're still there in the grape. And the byproduct, again, is more alcohol and more carbon dioxide. But now there's nowhere for that carbon dioxide to go. So it creates this built-up pressure. And so what do you have? You have exploding barrels and exploding bottles in these cellars um, to the point where they call it the, like the demon wine, the devil's wine, um, because they thought that it was demon possessed. Because again, when you don't understand science, you just blame it on anything that comes to mind. And, and um, so they called it the devil's wine and they had to create suits of armor, like metal suits of armor for cellar workers to go down there to protect themselves from these explosions that were happening uh, in the cellars. Finally, they figure out um, what's actually happening, and throughout many hundreds of years, they actually really hone in on the process and develop the better processes for managing the sparkling wine production, managing the bubbles, managing the whole fermentation process. They um, mm -hmm. now have thicker glass because of coal-fired glass production plants. Um, so now we're in the 1800s. Um, they figured out the corks with the cages on it to keep these from exploding. They figured out the whole process, but it took hundreds of years. And the people of Champagne were really the instrumental figures in terms of the development of that, those processes. Um, so Dom Perignon, you everyone knows the Champagne. He was a Franciscan monk in Champagne district um, in the 1800s. And he was actually really responsible for more like vineyard management systems to help make sure that the grapes were higher quality and some other winemaking techniques. He was uh, sober though, he did not drink. This was a misnomer that he invented champagne first of all, because it was an accident, we now know this. Um, he did not discover it, he did not invent it, and he didn't ever say, um, it tastes like you're drinking the stars, um, is, uh, is, the, uh, is the quote that's most often attributed to him. He didn't drink champagne, so um, he didn't actually uh, say that. The, it's, there's a lot of myths and legends that come with the marketing of champagne. But Dom Perignon was around in the 1600s, and these wines um, were starting to be developed in the 1500s, early 1500s, by monks, also monks, also all of these, um, during this day and age, a lot of the wine production was kind of um, controlled and developed by the church. Um, so for, for religious practices and to sell to make money for the church. So in the 1500s, these monks in this area of Limau were the first to really like practice making sparkling wine intentionally, not accidentally. So um, it's really fascinating the history. Most people attribute all of the sparkling wine production and the in invention of it to the, to the Champagne district. That's definitely what made it famous and they're brilliant marketers. So they took all the credit for, for sure. Um, but it's really actually historically accredited to these areas um, of um, Limo. And the grapes were Malzac. So that is what we're drinking here. Sparkling wine from the Limo district um, by the grape Malzac, otherwise known as Blanquette, the name of the grape in this area. So, what uh, what do y'all think, James and Danielle, of this um, of this wine? Mm. He has such a lovely mousse. It's a technical term for bubble structure, or just the feeling of the wine in in, in your mouth. 
the feeling of the bubbles in your mouth. And I think that they're such like silky soft bubbles. They're very fine. They're smaller. So when you, when you take a sip, it's not like it's your eyes are immediately watering. I think it's a very like delicately structured. And nowadays we know that we can kind of control a little bit more of the bubble size and bubble structure by the different secondary fermentation processes. Um, so, um, uh, not huge bubbly fans, but it was crisp and you enjoyed it. Excellent. Yes. Sparkling wine is, is certainly one of those things that, um, not everyone loves. Um, I think that there's definitely a time and a place for it. I have to be really tricky cause I'm allergic to a lot of sparkling wines. So, um, I have to be a little bit careful. So it's trickier for me to drink sparkling wines too. Once I find one that I know I can drink, then I drink a lot of it, but yeah. Um, so, um, um, this, the secondary fermentation process that was really honed in and, and developed by the people of Champagne, um, specifically Veuve Clicquot, uh, a wine, everyone knows the big orange label of Champagne uh, from, uh, from France. Uh, Veuve Clicquot, Veuve means widow. And so she was a widow that took over her husband's wine estate and helped craft the idea of how to make sparkling wine and how to, how to do it exceptionally. Um, and this was before patents were around. And so when she figures out these processes, it got out and the whole world starts making these sparkling wines too. Everyone's calling it champagne. The people of Champagne Lois are rioting. And they're like, no way in hell can you call your wine champagne. You are not from Champagne. We've been working on this for, you know, 500 years. Like, step down it, it's it's ours and so it was literally signed into treaties uh, special uh, spe specifically the treaty of versailles that no one can call wine champagne if it is not from champagne france made according to their methods um and um to this day the u.s did not ratify the treaty of versailles we signed it didn't ratify it so all of our california producers specifically were still calling their uh wine champagne if they were sparkling and it wasn't until the uh, 2000s that we signed an uh, agreement with the EU saying, all right, we won't do that anymore. There were a few wineries that were basically grandfathered into being still able to call their wine champagne because they've been around since the 1800s making wine calling it champagne for so long. And they are Corbel, Andre and Cooks. So you think about your college days of drinking mimosas and drinking those three wines and they're calling it champagne, um, the epitome of the opposite of uh, the true champagne method and style. So really, really interesting. So um, so this is, um, uh, so the secondary fermentation process is what they figured out over these hundreds of years. That's where you take still wine. So you are fermenting still wine. So in this case, 90% Malzac and 10%, you've got some Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc in there. Fermenting that just like you would regular wine. You blend that, put it into a bottle, whatever percentages, whatever blends you actually want. And then you put what's called a liqueur de tirage um, into the bottle. And that liqueur de tirage, is a little bit of yeast and a little bit of sugar to start another fermentation process or a second fermentation process in the bottle. Seal that with a beer cap, and then that bottle, we'll just use this as an example, goes on its side and it starts the secondary fermentation process in the bottle. So it's capturing all of that carbon dioxide staying dissolved in the bottle. Over time, after the fermentation process is done, it stays with the lees. The lees is that dead yeast of that fermentation process that was added during that liqueur de tirage. It stays with that. And the Blanquette de Limo has to stay on for nine months. Every region kind of has different rules about how long it has to stay with the lees. That adds a little bit more texture and complexity to the wine. Um, until it's fully upside down. So all of those dead lees or yeast are going to go down to the neck of the bottle and stay here. Then this is what Vuv Clicquot figures out, this whole riddling rack process of putting these bottles in racks and slowly changing them so they're upside down. The lees are going all the way to the bottom. Then you take these bottles and basically stick them in these large pans of water, very, very, very cold water, well below freezing, but it's not ice. And it's because they now figured out that salt changes the freezing temperature of ice. So it's super salty water well below freezing. So it's going to freeze what's in the neck of the bottle, but you can actually stick the neck of the bottle into it. 
um, since the water is not frozen because it's salty. So it's gonna freeze just the neck of the bottle because the water only goes up to here and that's where all of the, the yeast is. So you flip it upside down when you're ready for this process called desgorgement and you are going to basically flick off the beer cap and that pressure of this, of this wine that's built up is going to expel this frozen chunk of yeast. So that's gonna expel, you're gonna put the actual like real um, champagne cork in, you're gonna put the cage on so that the, the cork doesn't come out and that is how um, sparkling wine is made. That's how they capture the bubbles in the glass but also get rid of the yeast. So really fascinating history and um, we, we owe a lot of that to, um, to yes, the, 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 the monks that were in and around these areas and also the widows, because Vuv Clico is like one of three prominent widows who um, took over their husband's wine estates. We don't know why all of these um, men kept dying, but um, they, they were very ingenious uh, um, women who really changed the, 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 the whole wine world as a result of their ingenuity. So that is, uh, that's a long history. Sorry to start off with such a, such a long history note, but this is also an old regions past, so there's going to be a lot more history. So, hi Ryan, great to see you, James. I'm glad, glad, um, glad you're you're down with learning about that too. We have a small group in the chat room, so feel free to ask all of the questions. Um, most people these days in the summertime are going to be watching um, their classes at a at another date, and it's also Memorial Day weekend, so I figure most people are going on vacation. I just came back from one, but. Um, all right, next wine we are going to try is the Stoby Rosé. We have tried Stoby wines before in the Serbian and Macedonian wine class when we talked about their Ricazzatelli and their Vranets. Um, this is their Rosé. It's uh, their 2020 vintage right here. I love the peacock that's on this label. It's such a fun little bottle. Um, by the way, James and Danielle... Y'all need to get some of these. So I've been experimenting now with Corvin for a while. Been using Corvin for forever, but I just started experimenting with these um, screw cap adapters. So if you haven't seen these yet, um, what happens is you obviously can't use the regular screw cap. The Corvin needle would be bent on that one and it's not gonna reseal itself. So say that this was still close. So when you get a bottle that has a screw cap, but you want to save it for a long time, open it like normal and just immediately kind of put the, uh, the core vent on like that. The whole idea is that you don't want any extra air being got, gotten into it. So then this right here is a pierceable kind of like this, um, not plastic, almost like gel kind of center. And you can continue to use this for up to 50 times. So you might only use this screw cap adapter, you know, three times um, before you just take this off and, and drink the wine. Um, but you can use this actual adapter on the next wine and the next wine up to about 50 times, they say. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating. So now you can use this Corvin just like you would an actual real cork. They aren't <clears throat> super cheap, unfortunately. Nothing about the core event is super cheap. But it's made a huge difference to me, especially in doing these classes where I need to open up four wines, say all of them have screw cap. I'm just one person. So um, really, really highly recommend this. Once you use this, I'd say that your white wines are good for um, at least a month, if not more. Your red wines are good for about like three weeks I have found, and then I have found that the flavor starts dipping. So again, it's not as it's not as much, um, you don't get as much time as you do a real cork, but those extra weeks really do make a huge difference. So um, <clears throat> I like that comment that you might not need it for this wine, um, particularly because it's so good. Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right. So... Oh, you, you have some of these. Okay, great. Catching up on the chat room now. Sounds like you're drinking a great wine too, Ryan. That's awesome. Um, all right. So, oh, that's wonderful that one leaked and they sent you six extra. They have a couple different sizes, um, and but I haven't found any that need the larger size. So I just use the regular. They have a larger size, but I haven't found a single wine that ever needed 
that. So I don't recommend ever trying the larger size because that definitely didn't work. Mine was coming everywhere. So always just get the classic size. That's really good that they gave that great customer service. It's awesome. So <clears throat> Macedonia, where we are, so we're in the Balkans area. The Balkans is definitely has the most history in terms of the, the oldest winemaking regions in the entire world. So they say that the actual Vitis vinifera, Vitis vinifera genus and species of the grape varieties that we have throughout the entire world now originates back to Georgia. Then um, these clippings um, or cuttings from these vines were taken by the Phoenicians and planted all along the Mediterranean and, and then it spread from there. So uh, the Phoenicians were seafaring people, so they took these clippings on boats and kind of spread them throughout. They were seafaring people and traders, so they wanted to be able to basically constantly trade uh, wine in all of these stops. And so it was kind of their mission to also um, start uh, vineyards um, wherever they wherever they can. So it's not that um, all of these great varieties are kind of um, 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 they all originated from parents. And so these parents originate from Georgia, the country of Georgia, and then were brought and then they genetically mutate in the fields, whether it's just like one vine stops doing something and starts doing something else, all of a sudden it becomes kind of a different actual DNA, a different, different grape type, a uh, different vine type, um, or they can be cross-pollinated with different vines to then create children. So you can have mutations, and then you can have progeny as well. And so both of those things are happening throughout thousands of years. And thus we have so many different grape types. So there's thousands and thousands and thousands of different grape types out there, grape varieties. Um, and, um, and, and a lot of the most ancient ones come from this area, obviously, because that is where they all began. Um, so this grape is 90% Ricazzatelli. Um, and only 10% Vranitz. So Ricazzatelli is a white grape. Vranitz is a red grape. And so how do we get rosé, this color rosé, out of that? Now, I have actually tried to look this information up on their website, and there is just lots of information about history and culture, um, not a whole lot of information about how these specific, this specific wine was made. And so there's three different types of, of, of rosé. Most rosé is made from taking red grapes um, and then doing a direct press. So pressing the juice off the skins of the grape after just a matter of hours. So maybe the, the you pick the grapes, they go in the big bands, they get these stemmed, they get crushed, and then immediately they get pressed off. And that basically looks like the wine is in this cone that's a colander. There's an airbag in the middle that will blow up and then we'll like press the juice out through the colander, but keep the skins or the pumice inside the colander. Those go to compost. That's a modern way of doing it. Back in the day, it was just a basket and it was literally like a crank and you crank down these basket presses and the juice that comes out, this free run juice that comes out is, um, oh, that's not free run juice because you're pressing it, but the juice that comes out is only pink not red because it takes about four weeks for the juice to turn red from the skins of the grape because that's what gives the wine its color. And so if you just have a shorter amount of time, you get pink wine. So that is how most rosés are made. There's a different method called Sanye method, and that's where you take red grapes again. And if you want to make a more concentrated red grape, say um, Zinfandel, because white Zinfandel is kind of born in this fashion, Say you want to make red, red wine out of Zinfandel and you want it to be even more concentrated and rich in style, um, then you are going to, again, call, uh, stir up, macerate the juice with the skins. And then basically you bleed off or just reduce some of the juice down, again, after about 6 to 12 hours, sometimes up to 24 if you want a really intense rosé, but usually it's about 6 to 12 hours. And then you're going to ferment both of those separately. This juice will now be more concentrated, this red stuff, because you've, you've, you've extracted some of the, um, the, the water of it, so it's going to get a little bit more concentrated in flavor. And now you can ferment a rosé and a red wine from the same grapes. 
That's called Sanye method. A third method, which is what I suspect this is, is where it's an actual blend of white and red grapes. Often those are actually co-fermented. I don't know if this was co-fermented or if they were fermented separately and then still red wine was added to white wine. That's a very rare technique, usually only used in sparkling wine production, um, but um, it's possible that it could be here. So I am not really sure. Um, and um, that's the fun about wine sometimes is uh, not, not having all the information, not having all the answers. I know you think I have all the answers, but I promise you I do not. I love the smell of this wine. It is so juicy. I know you, you, you've already been drinking it, James and Danielle. What do y'all think of this rosé? It is like, to me, it's like strawberry shortcake, watermelon bubblegum. Um, those things. In a dry way, it's, a, it's not a sweet rosé, but it is this um, really um, loads of strawberry. Yes, yes, loads of strawberry. Um, none of these like white cherry, um, um, greener, white peach notes, apricot, tangerine, less of the citrus notes, and more of this like intense strawberry, which makes me think that it was still white and red, still white wine where 10% of red wine was added to it. That's what makes me think that just because the flavors are like this, um, but it very well could be just a co-ferment of, of, of the two. Um, let's taste So bubblegummy, yes. Juicy but not sweet. I do appreciate that about these types of rosés can sometimes be, as soon as I start smelling that bubblegum, it smells like as a kid when you had that bubble tape and you like ate it like it, like it, like it was a piece of tape. As soon as I start smelling that, I'm like, oh, I don't know about this one. Like it's it, probably going to be a little too sweet. And this is super fruit forward, very fruit forward, but it's really juicy. It's got refreshing acidity to it. And um, yeah, it's really just delightfully refreshing and crisp. Um, it's not cloying. It's not, it's not flabby or anything like that. Um, I think this would be really amazing with some spicier foods, some Cajun dishes, like I think jerk chicken, jambalaya, um, even like low country broil um, or boil, sorry. Um, um, where you just have a lot of those Old Bay seasonings, anything like that I think would be really good with this wine. The fruitiness is going to like tame down some of the heat um, and it'll be just like thirst quenching, you know, when you really want water, but you, I mean, you really want something to drink because the spicier food, but you don't want water. Uh, this wine I think would be really, really perfect with that. So yes, I um, now am just craving low, low country boil. So, so, so delightful. This is one of those wines that too, like meant to be consumed fresh and young. Highly, um, highly recommend uh, um, getting a bunch of this and just drinking it all summer long. Just keep it in the cooler. Super, super cold. Um, really good brunch wine too, I would say. So that dish sounds delicious. Yes, especially with that hot paprika, I would say for sure. So love that. Um, yes, yes. So um, I did read read about that in in uh, the grapes book that you can see behind me there on my uh, on, on one of my wine many wine shelves. So it is thought that Riccatelli was the actual variety that Noah planted on the flood. Um, because um, there's the mountain there, and that's where the boat was said to have landed, and um, and then he planted the vine, which if I had just gone through that too, I would be like, give me some damn wine, and uh, even if I have to wait three years to make it, like, this is the first thing I'm going to do is get on this uh, wine wine making thing, so I, uh, I, I love that, I love that story, so... Wine has such a long history back to like, we're talking ancient, we're talking caveman days. Wine has a history, but intentional winemaking technique from specifically grapes. Um, you know, we're talking about 8,000 years of history even. So it is really wild how much history there is in wine. So basically as soon as they figured out what happened, um, then they were like, let's do this more often. So back in the caveman days, this is how they say that it probably happened. 
Um, you can't afford to waste any food. So once you harvest these fruits, um, whatever fruits they are, they were often just like put in holes in the ground. Sometimes those holes were sealed with mud and stuff like that. So you're not just adding dirt to it. Um, they were sealed with mud and kind of caked. And so um, it, you would store any extra fruits there and you can't afford to waste it. So you're going to eat those fruits or drink the juice whenever, whenever you can, but you have to, you know, make sure you're saving them for time that you might not have them. So obviously fermentation is going to start naturally and, um, they probably drank it, ate it, and it probably tasted terrible, right? Because that is not a, that's not, that's not a delicious taste when your fruit starts just naturally fermenting. But they probably figured out that their cavemen husbands looked a lot sexier after the fact that uh, after after they drank the uh, the juice that they got from those uh, those holes preserving all of the fruit. So like, all right, well, we can keep doing this then. That sounds good to me. And so thus, thus wine history was born. But in terms of intentionally planting vines to intentionally cultivate that, that really didn't happen until the agricultural revolution where people stopped being roamers and started settling down in civilizations um, and, 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 and planting things to actually stay there in one place, stop being nomads and cultivate agriculture. So really, really fabulous. So um, Mount Ararat. Yes, that's the, that's the name of the mountain. Um, so awesome. Glad you liked it. Glad you thought it was great value. Um, I thought also it was delicious. So, all right. Well, let's taste this uh, Beaujolais. By the way, I bought that Stoby Rosé sight unseen for this class. There's only a few wineries that I, you know, not every winery I can do that to. When I when I taste a wine, that's when I decide what to do for a class. Um, when I can actually just look at a winery and say like, well, if they made it, I know it's going to be good enough to feature in a class regardless of what it is. I love that when I can kind of trust value um, from someone. And so, so far after that class, I've tasted a bunch of different wines from the Stoby Winery and they've all been really delicious. So, um, all right, we're going to Beaujador now. We have talked about this wine before. I have featured this wine before in class packs and different events. Um, I, I love the story and history behind this winery. And um, this is what we're drinking, the Vino de Tala. Um, Tala is the name for amphora, these clay pots uh, in Portuguese. This is from Alentejo, Portugal. I am using my Coravin now on these. I figured also, just like you did, that the rosé was, was so delicious, I probably didn't need to use uh, my uh, screw cap adapters for that. All right. So Portugal, while it doesn't have as much history in terms of um, winemaking as the Balkan areas does, um, it is not very far behind because again, anything close to the Mediterranean is where the Phoenicians planted vineyards, uh, to continuously go back to. So we're talking, you know, 2000, 2,300 to 2,600 years of history here, um, versus, you know, 8,000, um, in, in, in other areas. Um, so, we are uh, on the Alentejo region of Portugal. So I put the Portugal map up here, but now the sun is setting in my windows and it's harder to see. I apologize, but this is Portugal, so the Iberian Peninsula here. Alentejo is this region all throughout here, comes out to the coast, but it's a lot further inland too. So the, the bulk of Alentejo is further inland but it does come out to the coast right here. So it's the southern part of Portugal from the coast all the way to inland uh, to the border with Spain. In Portugal, you have a bunch of native varieties that aren't really grown anywhere else because again, as the Phoenicians are planting um, these, these, these vine clippings, they're genetically mutating, but the Portuguese weren't going all over. They didn't become like the French, like an empire and started spreading out everything. So the Portuguese um, people stayed closer there. And so those grapes really didn't start traveling elsewhere. So all throughout here, you have a bunch of different grapes, just like Italy was very similar in that way. So you'll see grape names that you might not ever see anywhere else. And so this is Trinchadera. 
Moreto and Tinta Grossa, which if you thought Tinta Grossa, that sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. It's also called, in other areas of Portugal, Tinta Barroca. So if that makes more sense to you, then uh, it's the same exact grape. Tinta means red um, and or tinted. Um, so a lot of the great names start with Tinta, and it gets very confusing when half of the grapes' names start with Tinta. But we're here in Portugal in the Alentejo region. So this wine would be called an Alentejano. Um, so wine from Alentejo. And this winery has not been around for very long at all. The winery itself is actually very new. But basically, this, uh, this winemaker producer, Pedro Ribeiro, he is the general manager of another winery in Alentejo. Um, and then this is his like passion side project. Um, so he, he really wanted to go back to traditional winemaking styles from like centuries ago and, and kind of unearth them again, uh, so to say, or kind of develop these winemaking styles again and bring them into the modern age. So no stainless steel vats, no, uh, n none of the traditional methods that we're used to seeing. No inoculated and cultured yeast to control fermentation more like everything is a little bit more back to basics with this so modern winery bringing back very ancient winemaking techniques uh in this project is uh is um this uh this wine so love those tasty notes blackberry jam campfire still burning hot campfire not smoldering i like that like bold smoky flavors there's so much fruit going on I love this like graphite -y kind of minerality that I'm getting to, like pencil shavings, um, a little bit of like floral qualities on this wine too. Um, not like rose water, nothing like sticky like that, more like um, fresh, um, fresh red flowers. Really, really, really delightful nose on this wine. So one of the winemaking techniques that he's bringing back is the use of tala. So tala is the Portuguese name for amphora with these huge clay pots. This looks quite small, it looks like something you just put flowers in. These are not small, these are, um, you know, five and a half feet tall, very, very wide and massive. So it's not something with these smaller holes on the top. So if you put the grapes in there to start the fermentation process, how do you get the wine out? And so how you get it out is so fascinating. The very bottom you have, you have holes that you can like drain out the wine from the top down. But to act as a filter, they will put, um, they'll destem the grapes. So they'll take the grapes off of the actual stems of the clusters. They layer all of the stems on the very bottom first. And that layering of that buildup of all of those stems stacked on top of each other acts as a natural filter for the wine so that when you're draining out, you're not getting all of the the like bits of broken down pumice of the wine so on top then they they the grapes go on top and they're crushed and macerated and the juice is fermenting and it's aging in these clay pots to make sure that the wines don't oxidize because you don't want too much oxygen to connect to your wine it will totally change chemically the the wine you don't want too much of that slight amount of it sometimes you do it depends on the winemaker but instead of having these special um, like um, um, plastic tops on it, which is what they have now, if, if you ever have cement aged wines or amphora aged wines, they're usually these not um, silica, um, silicon um, um, uh, uh, tops that you just like kind of clamp down to seal, seal the vents. But back in the day, they didn't have those. And so they still, at Beaujador, use this ancient winemaking technique where they'll actually pour olive oil on top. The olive oil has a different density, so the olive oil stays on top of the actual juice. The stems stay on the bottom, the juice is in the middle. And so the olive oil seals any oxygen, it acts as like a seal or barrier, so no oxygen is coming into contact with the wine but you don't need these clamps and tops for it. So really fascinating. I love just the, um, the history of that. I think about like back before any of these like mo more modern like stainless steel tanks and fermenting tanks and all of this stuff became a thing and all these special tops with clamps. 
how people had to kind of figure out how to make wine in the best way. And um, I love that he is using some of these same techniques. So um, anyway, so this wine um, is made in this way. His wine really sought after is his tallow wines, both his white and his red. I have not tried the white yet, so I'm very curious to try the white um, Fina de Tala. Um, and in fact, his, uh, his oak-aged wines actually command less price in terms of per dollar than his tallow wines because there's so much more demand for his vino to tallow wines. So usually oak is a very expensive part of making wine. Um, a new oak barrel can cost anywhere from $200 to $2,000 per barrel. So if you're a winery that wants a lot of new oak in their wines, then that is one of the big factors that goes into the price of the actual wine. So the fact that his oak aged wines are less expensive than his tallow just shows that like this is what he wants to do and the whole world is sitting up and taking notice. So really, really excited. Love this wine. Glad that y'all are drinking it and loving it with me as well. Um, great summer sipping red for you, James. Not too punchy. Yes. Still complex. Really like this one. Yes. Soon as it comes down for like summertime, tannins. Our body has a natural reaction to tannins that makes us feel a little bit more flushed. Um, and um, that's why sometimes people get like really red and blotchy um, and they kind of like almost like they have a hot flash with the tannins. It um, makes us, it warms our body temperature up, tannins do. It's just a natural response um, that, that, that human bodies have to tannins. And so when it's hot outside, you might want a red wine with whatever you're cooking, say ribs off the grill or burgers or something like that. But you don't want anything to increase that feeling of being too hot. And so tannins are naturally found in the skins of grape. You're already going to get some, but adding extra oak tannins on it just kind of intensifies that. So I, I, I love that you said it was a good summer red because that's exactly how I see it too. In fact, I feature this every summer for that reason. So, um, yes. Love that, uh, Ryan. That was used for foods, too. It's awesome. Let's taste. Mm. That's delicious. These vines are about 60 years old, so definitely not like super, super ancient vines, but definitely considered old vines. So if you went to the old vines class, you remember that anything over about 25 to 35 years would be considered old wines. And... Um, just love love what he's doing here. These actual tallow vessels that he got, he he he's using two hundred year old vessels. It's not like he made these new amphora vessels um, to practice this ancient wine making technique. He's actually using the ancient vessels too. Really, really enjoy that. All right. Well, whenever you're ready, we're gonna go on to the last wine of the evening. This is Vino Budimir. Again, we featured this winery in the Serbian and Macedonian class, but not the specific wine. Um, this is their Sub Rosa, Latin for like beneath the rose, basically meaning like um, beneath the seal of the rose, like, um, like it was top secret, it was confidential. And um, I guess some of their winemaking techniques are too, because again, just like Stovi, Vino Stovi, there's very little information on their winery about specific <clears throat> winemaking techniques, age of the vines, all of that stuff. Um, um, so um, we are going to be trying this wine. I need to get the pour it in. I really just like, really want to keep enjoying this closure. But knowing what's coming, I'm very excited to taste this Sabrosa. All right. <laughs> Last night, I opened this up to write the reviews for the class, and I was just blown away by the complexity of this nose. I just, every time it, I came back to it, I kept smelling other things, and uh, it kept developing and changing for me, and uh, it was it was such a unique nose, too. Um, really, really enjoyed tasting this last night. So this is their high-end. Um, of all the wines they make, they make the, the least amount of this, and um, it's like their highest quality wines. Um, I have, but it's been a few years, Ryan, um, um, 
Yeah, definitely. When I lived in Northern Virginia, more of these wines from the Balkans were available, harder to find here in uh, this area of Virginia, but um, yeah, sounds delicious. Um, great questions here. James, watch your biodynamics class noticed, uh, made a comment about how older vines stop producing as much and it becomes less productive to keep them. How the wineries manage to keep 60 year old vines. Great question. So they are producing less clusters. Generally speaking, most vines, like the older they get after about 35 years and they start producing fewer and fewer grape clusters, but the actual quality is high. So one of the, one of the factors that goes into the prices of wine is um, the actual yield, how much they're actually able to make. So the quality is increasing. They're going to want to continue using those grapes. They don't want to rip up the vines and plant new ones because the quality is increasing, but the yield is decreasing. So Economics 101, the price of those wines go up is, uh, is definitely uh, what happens with that. So so they, they keep producing them because, or they keep the 60-year-old vines around because they're able to, um, and especially if the vines don't have any issues with diseases or anything like that. Um, but yes, the price does go up. So if you notice on this wine, the price, the price goes up on this wine. Also, at 10 years old, this is their current release into the market. It was literally just released. They don't make it every year, so they made an 07 and 09, and now an 11. So about every two years, it seems, that they make this wine. Um, so we're in Serbia now, in the Zupa district in central Serbia. Um, Prokopats is one of the most like predominantly grown grapes. So, um, and this area of Serbia too has um, has not seen phylloxera um, that that I know of. It might just be these specific vineyards, um, but I believe in this area of Zupa, we don't have phylloxera. So phylloxera is that little louse that has like wiped off so many vines throughout its uh, nasty history um, around the world and it feeds on the roots of the vines. So most vines are actually Vitus vinifera on the top, but American root stock on the bottom. Think uh, Muscadine or Skepardong, not make, made into high quality wines, but their roots are actually too tough for the, uh, for the phylloxera louse to get through. So you take the rootstocks and allow the rootstocks to grow and you'll graft on, meaning like cut and then put a, 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 brand, a, a clipping of, uh, of the grape variety that you want to grow, whether it's Cabernet, Pinot Noir, whatever, into that. Uh, so two cut branches, put them together almost like a puzzle piece, they get tied around and then use sometimes even wax or tar is poured on top to make sure that it's fully sealed, that no, no diseases can get into it. Because just like humans, if you cut yourself, um, then that is a, a weak point uh, for the immune system. So it allows other diseases to get in until it's fully healed. So if you've ever looked through these old uh, vineyard pictures or walk through vineyards and seen tape and what looks like tar or wax uh, poured over, parts of the vine. Um, it could be, um, it could be very much that they're doing grafting, um, or pruning. Say sometimes one whole branch of a, of a, of a vine is dying or maybe it's disease ridden. So I'm going to chop all of that off, but I don't want any more diseases to get down into it through that open wound. And so I'll seal that off that way. So, um, if you blindfolded you and maybe you smell this wine, I would have thought you poured me something from a whiskey barrel. Yes, there's a lot of oak on this, right? So this has three years in barrel. Um, the Prokopats was aged in these 3,000 liter um, uh, Serbian oak barrels. So very, very, very large oak barrels. And the Cabernet was um, aged in just 225 liter. That's a standard size barrel. French oak barrel, both new, both 100% new. So three years in new oak also goes into the factor of the cost of the wine. Um, and you only do that if the wine is uh, going to be able to withstand it, which hold up to that new oak flavors, and then more in the bottle, and then it was finally released. So a lot of time went into making this wine too. So four weeks of uh, maceration too. So again, wines will sometimes, you know, from two to four, Four weeks, um, the juice will macerate on the skins to get more of the flavors, more of the phenolics, more of the coloring also, and the aromatics from the skins of the grape. This wine spent four plus weeks um, macerating 
on the wine. Uh, I mean, on the on the pumice. So unfiltered, unfined. So you might find some sediment on this wine also. And um, they've got they've got almost 150 years of history at this winery themselves. So fourth generation passed down, but a lot of ancient history in these vineyards and this area. Let's taste. Oh my gosh, the nose on this. A lot more woodsy tonight, I mean, that I'm tasting now. Last night when I tasted it, there was so much like blue fruit coming off of the wine, like blueberries and pomegranates, which uh, is definitely not a characteristic of Cabernet. So I'm guessing it's coming from the 60% of the Procopats. Um, and I'm getting more of that now that it's opening up a little bit, but definitely those like cinnamon, baking spices characteristics of this wine, cigar-like, absolutely. Lots of that tobacco, a little bit more like dried tobacco, like cigar box instead of like sweet tobacco or fresh tobacco. <sighs> Definitely this like peppery component, like peppercorn. <sighs> and like this boysenberry thing. Um, Really, really, really interesting. Continue to um, pour yourself a bigger glass of this um, if you've got it and um, just keep going back to it throughout the evening and see how much it continues to develop. All right, let's taste. Wow. So this wine to me drinks like a Bordeaux or a Bordeaux blend um, with um, with more Cabernet Franc and Merlot in it with that Cabernet Sauvignon. All of that oak aging gives it this like structure and phenolics and like grip that a Bordeaux has. Um, so complex. There is so much going on. But it's also really well integrated, partly because it has already spent, you know, it's already 10 years old. So it's, it's spent that time maturing and coming together. Um, it's just... Wow, there's so much going on in this wine. So to me, I would drink it like a Bordeaux too. So I would, um, grilled meats um, would obviously absolutely be perfect. This could withstand, um, like stand up to some lean, I mean lean, some gamier meats like lamb, uh, something with a little bit more intensity of flavor I think would be absolutely perfect. I think you could go in an earthier direction and go for some like mushroom components on your dishes, or you can go in a fruitier component, something like a um, cherry gastrique on, on it. Um, I would also like, I could see this with some like caramelized onions and some like root vegetables too. So you can go these like earthier or fruitier roots, these gamier flavors because the flavors, there's so much going on that you can almost like take any direction you want to go. Uh, with this wine. So it's amazing how fruity the wine is. Yes, it smells like this oak is just going to, that's what age does. It softens some of the actual like power of, of, of oak and those tannins and flavors. So, and it, and it's, it, it creates a silkier wine um, as those tannins age and fall out. You cannot think of another wine I've tried where the smell was so different from the taste. Yeah. And uh, tell me, if you corbined this, James and Danielle, or, or did you go ahead and pull the cork on this? Um, I am so curious at how much how much the wine tastes different now. I mean, I love it both um, now versus last night when I tried a glass of it. And there is, I think, something to be said for the biodynamic wine calendar. Um, if you have this app, I'm pulling up this app to show you here. It is called, uh, where is it? Here we go. It is called When Wine. And so you just pull it up and it gives you the calendar basically. And it will tell you, um, you I just do the free version so you can't look ahead to see when it will be good for wine. It's just whether or not it's currently good for wine. So in the biodynamic calendar, and I'll get into this just because you just watched this class, there's four days. There's a leaf day, a root day. Those two days, would they would say, would be not good for drinking wine. Like wine doesn't taste as good when you drink it on those days. 
And then we have a fruit day and a flower day. And wine tastes better when you drink it on those days. And it changes not on a 24-hour cycle because it follows the lunar calendar. So sometimes like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, it's not a good day. But then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it is a good day. So download the free version of the app. Very curious. So last night when I opened this up, it was a good day for drinking wine. And it tasted totally different. It did not taste as oaky last night. So... Um, and yes, I Corvin, it's the same bottle, um, but I'm going to try this again uh, on another, uh, either a, a flower day or a fruit day and see uh, see if my perception changes again. Also, I'm, I'm tasting this wine in a progression with all of these different wines. And your hormones are different when you're drinking to enjoy wine versus um, learning about wine versus teaching about wine. So anytime your um, cortisol levels are increased in your body, these sensitivities go down in your mouth to enjoy sweet things, but it heightens your sensitivity to bitter things. So really fascinating. Here's why. We've talked about this before, but there's nothing in the world that's naturally found that is sweet, that is poisonous. So nothing that's naturally sweet will be poisonous to us as humans. But many things to us as humans are poisonous that are bitter. So I think in this like fight or flight, this like survival mode, when cortisol is increased, when your stress hormones are increased in your body, it heightens your sensitivity to anything that might be a threat or a danger. And anything bitter, your body usually sends signals being like, oh, we don't know we like it. That's why anything that's bitter is an acquired taste. So I think that's why um, um, when you're really stressed or angry, if you taste something and like normally you might actually really like it, but you're like, ah, this wine is really bitter. I don't like it. Uh, it's because of, of those hormones and, and, how, and how they're changing those. So I, I posit that, but um, I have not actually read that in a specific study. So don't, don't take my word for it specifically. You curve into at six. Okay. So it has some time to breathe. I'm just uh, curious. I want to see uh, how this wine continues to develop. I will be buying a couple bottles of this because it's so young right now. Um, it's got so much more age in front of it, and it drinks like a wine um, much more expensive. So I'm, I'm very curious to see how this wine continues to develop. So, so yes, we have tasted now the oldest region for, for intentionally making sparkling wine from Carmen de Limon, um, Ricazzatelli, which those, that, that great variety was said to be the vines planted uh, by Noah after, uh, after the flood um, from uh, Macedonia. Tasted a very ancient winemaking style made in these clay pots. This before stainless steel vats or, um, or even cement. Um, so this, th that is the ancient winemaking technique that they used everywhere. And then they'd put them into like, leather skin canteen bags um and that's how they would drink it from there but until cement became developed and i don't remember exactly what year that was where cement became a more popular thing all of the wines are made like this so very traditional winemaking style to back to another very ancient grape one of the oldest grape varieties in the world procopats um yes blended with cabernet so a little bit more of a modern take on this um, but um, still 60% of that Procopats uh, from a very ancient wine region as well. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this class um, and learning a little bit more about these wines, these wine regions and winemaking styles and how it all came to be. Like, how did we get to where we are now where wine is consumed like water? It's very easy to find. Um, uh, there's a lot of history to get to where we are now. So, um, if the Romans started making wine and cement, I believe cement became later than the Romans. So I'm going to do some uh, research on that, and I will get back to you about um, when cement became a thing. I realized I started talking about that on live YouTube channel, and then I realized I didn't have the answer. So I apologize about that. So, um, yes, Ricazzatelli does mean red stem, um, and um, so in fact, they back in the back how they used to make the wine they would they would they would age the wine with the stems on it until it became like this copper wine what we would call orange wine these days um because of the color of those stems so really 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 fascinating stuff there so 
All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to this class. I look forward to seeing you Thursday nights in June. Um, I will release the calendar of, of those classes uh, shortly. Um, I had to come back out of vacation and, 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 and figure out life for a little bit. So um, um, thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the evening and uh, enjoy these wines. If you do keep drinking them and you've got them with some specific dishes that you really think brings them out, please let me know. So I'll see you later. Cheers. <laughs>